In this video, I'm going to be ranking the world's most famous 35mm and medium format film cameras in a tier list from S to D tier, basing it off of a variety of different things from price, ergonomics, the ability to take a variety of different types of photos, the heaviness, the sounds, etc. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. The first on the list is the Canon AE-1. The AE-1 has a great selection of lenses and is great at holding hands for beginners while also giving good control. It's relatively small and compact, but is quite expensive and is probably the most overhyped camera to ever exist for film photography. So because of that, I gotta throw it into B tier. Middle of the pack, nothing great, nothing bad, but nothing special. Next up is the Olympus OM-10. This is a great beginner camera and the beginner camera that I started on, so I will be slightly biased, but it is super small and light, especially in comparison to a lot of other SLRs. It is a great beginner camera, really knowing how to hold your hand, but allowing you to release and go into some more manual controls if you so choose to. Additionally, it has some great sister cameras like the Olympus OM-1 and OM-2, which are more professional grade cameras, but share a lot of the same accessories, lenses, etc. On top of all this, it is really cheap, especially in comparison to some of the other SLRs we're about to talk about, coming in at only $60, so because of that, I think it's the greatest SLR on the list and, and is deserving of the S tier. Next up is the Nikon F2. This is a legendary camera with incredible historical significance and has a legendary line of lenses with a great variety of focal lengths that are quite affordable. It's an absolute workhorse of a camera which is fully manual and doesn't require any batteries whatsoever. It is pretty expensive in my opinion, but it is justifiable, so because of that I'm going to throw it in the A tier. Up next is the Nikon F3. Now obviously this is the newer version of the F2, so all the good things about the F2 still apply to the F3, with some slight upgrades, it's better ergonomics, electric shutter, etc. Some of the problems though is it's not the smallest of SLRs and can be quite beefy. Uh, it is slightly more expensive, but I think the upgrades do make it worth the price. Uh, it is around $300, uh, but ultimately I think the two are very similar, so because of that I'm going to throw the Nikon F3 also into A tier. And last up for SLRs is the Pentax K1000. This is much more of a budget SLR in my opinion and can potentially be found at thrift stores or charity shops if you get lucky or the shop doesn't really know what they have. It's got a fast maximum shutter speed and it is fairly small, which is quite nice. However, I do think in comparison to some of the Nikon or Olympus SLRs, uh, specifically some of the ones we just talked about, I'd be hard pressed to recommend this. Uh, while it's not a bad camera by any means, for the price at typically around $200, I think the value is perhaps not worth uh, the camera, especially when some of these other cameras we just talked about are around the same price or cheaper. So because of that, I'm going to throw it in C tier. Not the worst, but just too expensive. All right, now that we wrapped up SLRs, we're going into point and shoots now, which keep in mind, these cameras are quite different in comparison to SLRs. So the fact that some cameras don't have as much manual control uh, will not be nearly as much of a deal breaker, for example. First up is the XA2. This is a super tiny, quirky point and shoot, which can be taken literally anywhere because it is literally pocketable and has a surprisingly sharp lens, a 35 millimeter F 3.5. It's also got a cool clamshell design that should protect the lens, uh, however the plastic body feels kind of flimsy and cheap sometimes, uh, and I actually had a ton of issues with the camera shuttering and with it firing, uh, and just wasting frames. Uh, a lot of times I would try to push the button and it wouldn't go, or it would accidentally trigger in my pocket. So it was just honestly a big pain in the ass. Also, I don't know if it's my fault or my old lab's fault, but a lot of the photos were not very sharp and seems kind of out of focus so i'm not sure if there's something wrong with the focusing system or if it's all uh, user input error or human error but yeah I, I just i didn't really love it it's not super cheap and the prices seem to be going up it's like 150 bucks but people really do tend to love it so for most people it probably sit in b tier at least because people really do love this camera but because of my troubles with it and what felt like just infinite shortcomings it's got to be in the C tier. Next up is the Contax T2. The thing that stands out most about this to me is the incredible build quality of it and the amazingly sharp lens. I've dropped mine so many times and it's got a bunch of little things in it, but because it is made of titanium, it just 
truly is a tank, and with the Carl Zeiss lens which hides itself in body, it's protected and still offers a really sharp, great lens. The design is so simple yet intuitive, allowing to shoot it like a completely automatic point and shoot, but also giving you some manual controls to where if you uh, want to shoot something you know, specifically, you're able to do that. The biggest con is obviously that it's so expensive. It's like $800, $1,100 for some of the uh, colors and stuff. So because of that, I can't justify putting it in S tier, even though I love this camera and I think it truly is one of the best point and shoots ever, despite the price. But I do think putting it in B tier would be underplaying uh, how nice and premium of a camera it is, despite its price. So therefore, it's going in A tier. Next up is the Ashika T4. This camera is incredibly lightweight and robust, despite its tiny little plastic body and it's super quick to draw and take photos. Compared to the T2, this thing is lightning fast, where the T2 takes a little bit of uh, prep time for the lens to open up, get its focus, etc. Additionally, the lens on the Ashika is one of the sharper lens in a point and shoot, which honestly can't be undervalued when you're shooting some more informal photos. However, the plastic body can feel kind of cheap and flimsy, and it is very expensive for a camera that's I wouldn't consider it really a premium point and shoot camera. It's just gotten really hyped and popular. So because it is $600 and feels just driven up by the hype completely, yes, the context is as well, but the context feels more justifiable because it really is the top end where the Ashika just, it just feels like a hype beast to me. So because of that, I'm gonna throw it into the B tier. It's a great camera, but for the price, I don't think it's worth it. Next up for point shoots is the Olympus Mu2. This is a light compact camera with a really impressive autofocus and the price, while still expensive, if you're gonna pay for a pretty well-known point and shoot for the quality, this feels more appropriate being like around $200. Uh, however, I think with point and shoots, it says less about Olympus's design and build quality and more about the state of point and shoots and the popularity of them with the prices getting driven up. It's also splash proof. This coupled with the many other features, I could see this being an incredible, almost perfect camera for someone. But for me, a lot of the downfalls outweigh a lot of the pros. So again, it is extremely plasticky and feels almost hollow because it is so light sometimes. And I also noticed that the mechanisms in it can be kind of janky. Sometimes when you open the clamshell, the lens won't open all the way, it won't fire. I've just noticed a lot more issues with this than many of the other point and shoots. Other than the XA2, that thing, again, uh, was a pain. Um, so yeah, because of all that, it's again, not great, not horrible. I'm gonna throw it in B tier. Middle of the road, it is a fairly cheap uh, point and shoot that has a pretty decent lens, but you can get some point and shoots for like 20 bucks. So is it worth the 10 times price hike? Mm, I don't know, I guess that's for you to decide. Next up is the Contax T3. Now, this is the epitome of a luxury point and shoot camera. It's a thousand percent a flex to own, and it's probably the smallest 35 millimeter point and shoot camera today. It still offers the unbelievable 38 millimeter Carl Zeiss lens, which is so sharp that it truly doesn't even feel like a point and shoot. It's super easy to use as well, from nights out to behind the scenes shots. The camera excels at literally everything. Again, like the T2, the titanium body proves to be beefy and strong while still light and slender. However, despite all the greatness about it, the main drawback is the unbelievable price of these. Even with the Contax T2 being $800, this feels like chump change compared to the two to three grand that the T3s warrant, which honestly, I couldn't justify the price difference for minimal mechanical differences between the T2 and T3. To me, the biggest difference is just the size, which if you're already looking at a pocketable point and shoot, it's like, what's the difference in another couple grams or inches or whatever it might be? That's what she said. But I just don't think it's worth it. I think it's too expensive and the prices just continue to seem to go up. So this is gonna be the first camera in the D tier list. Again, I don't hate the camera. I just think for the price, it's just not worth it whatsoever. And lastly, for the point shoots, is the Minolta TC1. This is an extremely small camera deemed as, I think, the lightest point shoot ever from what I could gather uh, from my research, weighing only 226 grams, which is insane. 
The lens is also brilliantly sharp. It's a f3.5 28 millimeter G Roker lens and gives a unique look to it with slight vignetting around the corners, giving it the classic TC1 look. Again, like the contacts, the titanium body makes it feel really quality. But also like the contacts, it is very expensive and that's probably its only real downfall coming in at around a thousand dollars but because of this but i would have a hard time recommending the tc1 over the contacts t2 as i think the t2 just feels better so tc1 going in b tier next up are the few range finders on the list uh, first up is the contacts g2 the g2 has an incredible build and feel to it with its perfect size weight and titanium body its 45mm f2 offers a unique focal length with great sharpness and size to it, and it really is quite a joy to shoot, being tight, concise, fast, while still feeling in control. Ultimately, it's one of the most fun 35mm cameras I've ever shot, blurring the lines between a rangefinder, SLR, and point and shoot, kind of offering the pros for all of them into one titanium body. That being said, it is really expensive, but it is a premium camera that does really lean into a lot of these strengths while offering minimal downfalls. One of the bigger downfalls, which goes to be said about any contacts, but I think is especially pertinent with the G2s and how they're built with their electronics, is the fact that they are susceptible to breaking. The electronics sometimes wear down or a gear will wear out. And also one of my friends who owned one of these cameras, he had dropped it and it shattered some of the uh, smaller electrical mechanisms inside, uh, rendering it essentially useless. However, I do think that that is a unlikely scenario. So the G2 is gonna get put into the A tier because I just think it's strengths and the fact that it feels like so many different cameras into one is just so good. Next up is the Leica M6. The historical significance alone is enough for this thing to be towards the top of the list. With its legendary line, with its legendary size and lineup of lenses, the greatness in this body is truly undeniable. The lens finder is very clear, sharp, and concise, and Leica is probably the only manufacturer on this list that is still making new bodies and supporting their camera in 2023. Again, it's incredibly expensive at $2,500 for just the body, but for good reason, being that it is one of the greatest cameras ever created. So because of that, I gotta throw it into the A tier. All right, moving on to my favorite sets of cameras, medium format. First up on the list is the RB67. Now this is, in my opinion, one of the greatest portrait cameras of all time, and the bevels focusing allows for some super up close macro shots. It also has swappable backs, which allow you to shoot a multitude of different roles, and is relatively cheap for a legendary 6.7 system. Whoa. And is relatively cheap for a legendary 6.7 system coming in at around $400. The best part of it all is it doesn't require any batteries. However, there are some issues to be said with the RB. Uh, the first is that it's extremely heavy and that the shutter slap is one of the loudest, if not the loudest there is. Uh, so it's just not ideal for landscapes or travel photography or you know street photography or anything where you need to be low key because of its massive size and sound. Despite this, it's definitely gotta be in the A tier list. Like I said, it's one of the greatest cameras ever made. Uh, other than its huge size, if this was just used in a studio or something, this camera is undefeated. Moving on to the sister camera, the RZ67. Again, like the RB, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest portrait camera ever made. It has all the benefits of the RB, but with an electric shutter, a more ergonomic body, and can be advanced with a single stroke instead of needing two. Despite the electric shutter, I think the electronics in this beast can be worrisome. Uh, many people online who have owned these cameras, I'm pretty sure Willem Verbeek and Volandis both, have ended up having some of the micro electronics fry on them inside. So because of this, I would highly recommend the batteryless RB67 over its newer, more expensive, more complicated counterpart coming in at $1,000. So because of this, the RZ I have a hard time justifying because the RB is just so much cheaper and does all the same things with just a little bit more manual input. So the RZ is gonna get put into the C tier. Next up on the list, the Mamiya 7. The Mamiya 7 is one of the most ergonomic, light, travel medium format cameras ever made, if not the best. It has an incredible set of lenses for any scenario and is potentially the greatest landscape, lifestyle, and environmental portrait camera ever made. It feels so good to hold and shoot. Uh, even the shutter is so quiet and not intrusive. And additionally, so, so many great photos have been taken on this camera. So it's just hard to deny its importance to medium format. 
Some of its downfalls include uh, that it struggles with macros or close-up portrait shots. You know, it can't do those extremely tight macro shots like the RB or RZ can. Uh, and it is quite expensive being around $3,000 for a body with a lens. But it is so good at what it does that I had to put it in S tier. It's the greatest camera I've ever used by far. It's the most fun camera to ever use. It's so lightweight. You can bring it anywhere and it can really shoot anything. So because of that, the Mamiya 7, one of the greatest of all time, is S tier. Next up is the Mamiya 6. Now, I've never actually used this camera, so I can't really speak firsthand, but again, it's up there for portability and ability to capture wonderful scenes is up to par with the Mamiya 7. It also is a bit easier to use than the 7 because of less external viewfinders and other uh, lenses and just kind of stuff that bogs down the 7 sometimes. Uh, but it is still $1,800, so I don't think I could recommend the 6 over the 7 being that it is somewhat close in price. Yes, it's still $1,200 off, but if you're paying over $1,500 for a camera, I would just get the one that you want best and works best and is known to be the best. So while the Mamiya 6 is great and I think it is an A tier camera, I think the Mamiya 7 beats it and yeah, I'm going to leave it in A tier. Next up and moving away from Mamiya is the Pentax 6.7. Pentax 6.7, despite its massive size, this camera is an incredible studio camera or tripod camera. For the price of around $800, the original Pentax 6.7 is truly a workhorse that shines with any type of photo. From portraits, landscapes, macro shots, lifestyles, etc., this camera can do everything. Additionally, there are a couple different versions that range in mechanics and price, making it accessible for different folks who are looking for a different experience. Also, the wood handle makes for great hipster points on these bad boys, so that's always a plus. Or a minus, I guess, depending how you look at it. Now, like the RB67, the sound that the shutter makes is almost unbelievable and is so loud and clunky. Good luck doing any low-key wedding or shoot photography with this. It would be honestly i think impossible additionally the camera is extremely large and heavy but that's about it for its shortcomings so because it is such a great camera that allows you to shoot any type of photo uh, despite its 800 dollars somewhat high medium format price i do think it is an a tier camera and one of the best medium format cameras to exist next is the pentax 645 this camera has a great aspect ratio to bridge the gap between 35mm and larger medium format. It's a good price for a very high quality 645 camera at $400-$500, and it's also highly portable and reliable, never causing any grief when you're shooting it. However, the camera shutter sound can be quite loud. It isn't modular like the Mamiya counterpart we'll talk about momentarily, and the viewfinder is pretty dark and dim to use, so because of all these not great things about it, I'm going to put the Pentax 645 in B. Next up is the Contact 645. There's a lot of newer technology that can make this feel quite similar to a uh, digital SLR in a lot of ways, which can be good or bad depending how you look at it, but it does have some of the best lens selections for 645 in all the cameras. However, the price on the Contact 645 just kills it for me being at around $2,000 for the camera. While I do think the camera is honestly really great, it does have some specific use cases. You know, a super professional, expensive 645 camera does make sense for uh, shooting some fashion or magazine type photos. But, but when I'm shooting medium format, uh, long term, and I think this will be true for a lot of other people uh, that are watching, I really want to be getting those 6x6 or 6x7 negatives that truly show how much bigger medium format is than 35mm. Because of this, I do think it is slightly overpriced for 645 or medium format camera, so I'm going to throw it in the C tier. Again, I think the camera is great, but for the price, I think it's a C tier. Next is the Mamiya 645. This is an incredible beginner medium format camera to learn on. Uh, it's the one that I learned medium format on. It's the one that I learned on when switching from 35mm to medium format. Uh, you know, just like all the other 645s, just the aspect ratio gives the most freedom and forgiveness when it comes to shooting medium format. You're not wasting all your money on these large negatives that you don't even know if they're going to turn out good. That's beside the point. The Mamiya 6 it's a modular system that lets you craft it how you want, being able to swap different viewfinders, lenses, handles, etc. Also, it's a super cheap system to get into medium format with the Pro, which is one of the top line models being $500, but you can certainly find some of the cheaper ones like the Super or 1000S for 
two, three hundred dollars. Because of this, the Mamiya 645 has got to be one of my favorite medium format cameras and definitely one of the best 645 cameras, so it's going to go into A tier. Next up is Hasselblad 500CM. Probably one of the most legendary cameras on this list, the 500CM is the pinnacle for design, functionality, and aesthetic for medium format cameras. So many historical photos have been taken on the 500CM as well. Shots of the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, Audrey Hepburn, and Ansel Adams landscapes as well. The modularity and tightness of the camera makes it an unprecedented marvel that still holds great value in its design today. Sadly, the one major drawback or issue with it is the price point coming in at just under $2,000 for the camera and lens. Because of this, I can't put it in an S tier, but it is just beneath that going right into A tier. Up next are some TLRs. First up is Rolleiflex. Not looking at any model specific, but rather all the TLRs by Rolly. Because of the size, shape, and waist level viewfinder, you get some very unique compositions with these cameras. I think with these cameras, there's a sort of romanticism that, that comes into play with people who really enjoy shooting these. It's not for ease or convenience, but for aesthetic and the way the camera feels in your hand and how it shoots. I guess many people really love the look and the ergonomics, but Man, when I use these, I cannot stand it. I like looking down through the waist level ground glass, but the tall rectangular shape of it, I just cannot get used to. It feels so obtuse and awkward and just doesn't feel right. And additionally, for it being upwards of $500, I have a hard time recommending this in place of some other cameras. So because of that, Roly is going to go into C tier. Up next, the Mamiya C330. I'm going to be referencing most of the Mamiya C line here, which is a fairly unique camera for Mamiya to have made at the time. It has a bellow focusing system, which allows for close up photography without attachments, and it also has a decent amount of lenses to swap onto. On top of that, it is fairly modular with all its accessories, allowing for a good amount of customizability. Now again, I don't love TLRs and don't see too many people shooting with them, but for the price around $300, I don't think it's the worst camera to start your medium format journey with, and because of that, it's going to go into B tier. All right, only three cameras left, and the next one is Trash. I don't really know what to say about the Holga 120 other than it's just not worth it. It's a toy camera, and it clearly looks like it. It's completely plastic with a shitty plastic lens, so I can't really recommend it or even defend it. If you want a toy point and shoot, honestly, just get a cheap 35mm one. It'll be much more bang for your buck, and not just disappointing, in my opinion. So because of this, Holga is getting thrown into D tier. All right, and second last is the Fuji GA645. It's one of the most compact, easy to use and shoot medium format cameras ever released, making for a great travel camera. It's fully automatic, essentially making it a medium format point shoot. And it also comes with a 60 millimeter F4, which is a pretty sweet lens on medium format and is quite sharp. Also, it has a built-in flash, leaning even more into that point and shoot feeling. Now, despite being a point and shoot, the camera is quite slow and loud. You're also locked into a fixed lens, meaning that you won't be able to swap out to a different focal length. On top of that, the electronics can be known to be quite finicky with these, so definitely be careful if you're in the market. For a $1,000 medium format point and shoot, I have a tough time recommending this for most people, unless you're looking for high resolution photos that take minimal effort. So because of this, I'm throwing it into C tier. And last on the list is the Texas Leica. Named after working essentially like a 35mm rangefinder Leica camera, the Fuji named the Texas Leica just brings it to a larger size. From camera size to its 6x9 aspect ratio, everything about this camera is big. Because of the aspect ratio, tons of information is being captured and thus the images can be blown up huge. Additionally, the camera feels great in your hands despite its size and overall it's just really fun to shoot. It's only around $500, which is a very fair price for a monster of a medium format camera, in my opinion. However, that being said, the uniqueness of the 6x9, while it is super nice, getting used to the unique aspect ratio can be quite confusing. The viewfinder patch in the camera is also quite small and difficult to use. And lastly, the 6x9 aspect ratio also means you only get 8 shots per roll, which sometimes, in my opinion, is simply not enough, especially if any of those shots get messed up. So because of all this, the Texas Leica is going to see. All right, I think that's going to wrap it up for this video, guys. Let me know down in the comments what you think of the list. I think this is a pretty good list. I think there's a decent amount of wiggle room to swap some cameras here and there, depending on how much you value nicheness, price, availability, 
uh, aspect ratio, stuff like that. So definitely let me know down in the comments below which cameras you agree with and disagree with. It's really interesting to hear, especially in the last video I made about the film stocks, uh, where you guys would swap some of the film stocks had you made this list on your own. That being said, I'm gonna drop this tier list down in the description, so if you do wanna fill it out and then use that to reference for comments or whatever, feel free to do that. I would love to hear your opinions. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned until the next video. Peace out, stay shooting, stay safe. Adios.